years ago, there was a study done where they took a bunch of kids, 10, 11, 12 years old, somewhere in that range, took them, put them in a house by themselves, specifically boys, put them in a house by themselves with toys, with food, and then they had cameras set up everywhere to monitor just in case something went really bad, but just to see what they would do. And you can imagine this is really insane, but it was very controversial, but they did it. And what they found was one, by the end of the first day, the house was completely destroyed, as you can imagine. I mean, totally destroyed. They had essentially run through all of the food that was supposed to last them for a long time. They ran through it all in about the first day. But what they saw over time was these boys ended up creating kind of like some house rules. And these are young kids, like around the age of 10, creating house rules and groups and all this together. And, and so they're, they're sitting and, and, and they end up coming up with how they're going to operate because, as you can imagine, chaos, pure chaos everywhere. Because that's what happens, right? Whenever, anytime there's something going on in, in our lives, when, when there is a lack of or, or, or we don't have any kind of like system to function in, what do we end up doing? We create chaos or we allow ourselves to live. And so that's exactly what happened with these boys. Today, what we're going to be talking about is we're going to finish out a series called Heaven, Who Goes There? And in the first two weeks, we asked questions and we did our best to answer those. One was, how good is good enough? Because there's, this, there's an assumption that most of us make. In America, 83% of, believe, of people, not just believers, of people believe that there is a good place after this life, that there's something else afterwards, 83%. But the majority of those people believe and make the assumption that heaven is a place for good people. And you know what the second, the second assumption is? And I'm a good person, right? And so there's this assumption, and we walk through why that is appealing, why it even makes sense on the surface, right? Because if there's a good place with a good God, then surely that's where good people go. But there's some unsettling realities along with that. One of which is we have no idea what good looks like. There's no uh, just decided upon standard of good everywhere, right? I mean, even from family to family, town to town, nation to nation, one side of the world to the other, how we define good is different. It, not just in nation to nation or town to town, but even over time, right? If you go back 2,000 years ago, the way that we define good 2,000 years ago looks nothing like it does today, does it? Good has changed over time, and it changes geographically. And so one of the problems with the idea that good people go to heaven is it's very surface level, that we're missing out on this aspect of well, what actually is good. How do we define good? What is it? And so that was, those were some of the problems that we discussed in week one of if good people go to heaven, then what's wrong with that idea? One of the things we finished with was that if good people go to heaven, then God is not good. Then God's not good because surely if God is good, good people to go, go to heaven, he would have defined good for us. Right, he would have given us what good looks like. And so week two, we redefine good. That's what we did. We looked to see what scripture says. And here's what good is. Good is not a list. Good is not a, a set of things to do or things not to do. Good is a person. And his name is Jesus. And you and I aren't that good. And so we, we miss the mark. We, we, we aren't good enough. And so if good people go to heaven, bad news for all of us because we're not good. And this week, what we're going to talk about is in the midst of that, if, it, if it's not that good people go to heaven, and we finish with John three sixteen through 18, which says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. He did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him, right? There's, there's some things there that don't make sense to us, if we're honest, but when it comes to rules, right? Because there are still laws, there are still rules in our faith and how do we how do we pair that with with just belief which is what John 3:16 says how do those things go together it, it almost seems like they're contradictory right i mean why would there be rules and this thing that says we we're supposed to believe how do those things go together and so today what we're going to talk about is the role of rules why are there even rules to begin with in the US there are some crazy ones i don't know if you guys have ever heard any of these but just to give you a few of these crazy rules listen to this these are real, not even a joke. 
there, there can be up to a $500 fine for unsolicited pizza in Louisiana. That sounds crazy. I will not fine you. If you send me pizza without me knowing, I'm good with it, all right? You, you can send it anytime you want. Uh, in, in North Carolina, bingo can't go for five hours. And you can't be intoxicated while you're playing. So the, that's, that's a law in, in, in North Carolina. Listen to this. In Vermont, again, these are real, okay? I'm not even joking. They're probably not enforced, but they're real. In Vermont, women can't get fake teeth without written permission from their husbands. No idea where that one came from or how that was put in place, but that's a thing. No donkeys are allowed in bathtubs in Arizona. So in case you're ever in Arizona with your donkey, don't bathe it in the bathtub, apparently, because that is illegal. And even in our own state, we've got some strange ones. Listen to this one. This, uh, this sounds crazy, but this is good advice for you. It's illegal to walk a mule on the sidewalk in Virginia. So in case you were going to go home tonight and, or this evening and walk your mule, don't do it on the sidewalk, okay? Because in Virginia, you're not allowed. It's illegal. You know, there, there are some crazy laws out there, and you guys have probably heard of some, but, but here's the thing. With, without any laws, what would we have? Chaos, right? There's a, there's a reason behind the laws that exist, and it's to try to create order. There's a, there's a reason for it. And so we, what today we're going to be talking about is this role of rules in Christianity in our, in our faith. What, what's the point? How, how, do we, how do we pair these two things together? How do we pair rules? And, and when we read things like John 3, 16, it says, whoever would believe. Because generally we'll, we'll go to one extreme or the other. We'll either go, you got to follow the rules or you're out. Or we'll say, all you need is belief. And because they just seem like they contradict. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the role of rules in our faith. And we're going to have to go all the way back uh, to one of the first stories in Scripture. But before we do, I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer and just ask that God would open our minds and our hearts and uh, help us to see whatever He wants us to see. And so let's do that together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. God, right now in this moment, we, we want to hear from you. God, let everything that I say not be the things that, that I want, that not be the opinions that I have, but God, let them be straight from what you have already said in Scripture. God, get me out of the way. God, say what you want to say and open our minds and our hearts. Let us hear. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've got to go all the way back to one of the very first stories, and it's the creation story. And in the creation story, if you don't know, there's, uh, God creates the whole world, and, and then he creates this man named Adam. And he creates man, and then after he creates man, he gives him one rule, and he says, the only rule is what? Don't eat from the tree the knowledge of good and evil. You can eat from every other tree, but don't eat from that. God gives him one rule. Now, what came first? The rule or Adam? What came first? Adam, right? Adam came before the rule, but there was one rule. Now, if you don't know the whole story, well, they eat from it. <laughs> they break the one rule, and, and sin enters into creation, and creation begins to crumble in many ways due to the sin that is just wreaking, ha wreaking havoc through, through the creation. And, and because sin is getting so bad, people are killing each other. I mean, there, there are horrible, horrible things happening. And we get to one of the saddest parts in all of Scripture. And God says that he regretted that he made them. But there was one family, specifically with a guy named Noah, and he says that Noah was, was not like this. He was, he was different. He, he was set apart in some ways. And, and so God sends a flood, but Noah and his family are rescued, and, and then we move on down the, the story a little bit, and out of that family, there's a man named Abraham that God, at the time, Abram, that God calls out and says something specific. So let's look at that together. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. You ready? The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, pretty interesting 
God, God makes a promise, and specifically there at the end, he says, it's a promise for all peoples, all families of the earth. God makes a promise, and that story continues, and, and God sets this up as a covenant promise. And a covenant essentially means that God made a contract, is, is kind of the way that it, that it works. There's a contract that God makes, and, and the way that this covenant works, it was a blood covenant. And here's, I know it's going to sound graphic, hang in there with me. God says, go and get these specific animals and split them in half, putting the two sides, and then we're, what, what happened is in this blood covenant, they would walk between the two halves. Sounds gross, I know. But here's the point. Was in that kind of covenant, what you were saying was, if I break this covenant, let it be done to me as it was done to these animals. It, it was a very serious covenant, a very serious thing that was happening here. And God is making this covenant with Abraham, but Abraham goes into a deep sleep. And guess what happens? God walks through for God and for Abraham. God walks through for himself and for Abraham. In other words, what God did was he said, when you are not faithful, I'll still be faithful. Hey, I'm going to keep my end of the deal and yours. Because God knew there was, there was no way that Abraham was going to hold up this, his end of the deal. There was no way. And so instead of letting Abraham walk through, God walks through for both of them. In other words, I will be faithful, and when you're not, I'll still be faithful. God makes this promise with Abraham. And then we keep moving in the story, and we get to this man named Moses, and, and there's a, another covenant that's made with Moses. This is often called the Mosaic Covenant, and it's, it's this thing where God gave him these laws. You may have heard the story. God gave him these laws. There, there were a lot of them. First, we have the 10, but there are a lot of laws, about 613 commandments total. And God says, if, if one of these are broken, if, if, we, if you break any of these laws, the only way that forgiveness can happen is if blood is shed. It's again, it's a blood covenant. And so this is where the, the idea of, of animal sacrifice is introduced and why we hear about that oftentimes in, in history but, and in the Old Testament. The, the point was that blood needed to be shed. Some, something had to die for forgiveness of sin to take place. Now, we've got two covenants. One, Abraham, with Abraham, and God says, I will be faithful even when you're not. And then we get some laws. What came first? The promise or the laws? The promise. Do you see a pattern? God makes Adam, he has relationship with Adam, and then he gives a rule, law. He makes a promise with Abraham. 430 years later, he introduces laws. The promise came first. Very important we don't get these out of order. Now, listen to what uh, some of this says here is. Specifically, we're going to look in Deuteronomy uh, because we're going to find four reasons that God gives these rules or these laws. Because again, the question that we want to answer today, what are the role of rules? What, what's the point, right? And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at Deuteronomy beginning in chapter 10. Deuteronomy 10, verse 13. Look at what this says. And to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for whose good? For your own good. See, I think the first reason God gives any rules, any laws, is for our good. Imagine, for those of you who are parents in the room, if you didn't give any rules or any guidelines for your kids, what would it look like at your house? Again, chaos, destruction, right? You probably wouldn't have a home anymore because if there is no order, we find chaos. And so God says, I'm giving him for your good. Whenever you gave your children a rule of not going out into the street in front of your house, why did you give them that rule? Was it because you said, you know what? I bet they'd have a lot of fun out there. I bet I can ruin it. Some of you may have, but not everyone, right? The reason you did it is because you love them, right? And because even though they can't see it, 
even though a child may not be able to know that the road is not a safe place to play, in, the, in their mind yet, you do. And because you understand something deeper than, and, and more so than they understand, you give them a rule. Why? Because you love them. And so we see here, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 13, is for their own good. Here's the second reason I think God gives these laws or these rules, and this is Deuteronomy 31, verse 12 and 13. Look at what this one does. Assemble the people, men, women, children, and the foreigners, residing in your town, so they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of this law. Their children who do not know this law must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. I think the second reason that God gives laws and rules is God reveals his character to his people. God's revealing himself uh, to have a deeper understanding of who he is through the laws, the rules that he has given. See, we get to see that God is, God is a holy God, that, that he is unlike anyone else, that, that he's holy and that he's to be feared, that because he's greater than anything that we can understand or comprehend, God reveals himself to his people through the laws and the rules that he establishes. Here's your third reason I think God has given these uh, for their own good, to reveal himself to them. But here's the third one, to set them apart, to reveal himself to others. God is is setting apart a nation to reveal himself to others. Look at what Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8 says. Observe them carefully, for this will show you show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them? The way the Lord our God is near us, whatever we pray, whatever we pray to him. And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? You see what he said? People will notice a difference. God God gave them for their own good. God gave them to reveal himself to his people, but also so that his people would be set apart to reveal him to the other nations around. And I think it's the reason God also as those laws and those rules and those things for, for us. God, God is setting us apart because without it, you and I would look exactly like everyone else. You know, part of being Christians, part of being people who follow Jesus is we're to be set apart, be different than everyone else and everything else. And so part of the reason that God has given it, one, we've got for their own good, for, to reveal himself to his people, so that his people are set apart to reveal him to others. Have, have you ever, you ever been around maybe a neighborhood kid, or if you're a teacher, uh, you ever heard the rules at someone else's house and then gone, I'm judging their parents. Any, anyone else? It's happened before. You don't have to raise your hand. It's happened. Listen, there was a time where I worked with kids here, and their Jonah is now working with kids We've heard lots of stories about the rules at your house, okay? Lots and lots of stories. I had a kid one time specifically tell me, I am only allowed to cuss if I'm defending mom. I don't know what that means. I don't know how that happens. <laughs> That's what he said. I may have been judging a little bit, but I mean, but, but that's probably happened to you. Or, or maybe you just experienced someone and, and you just thought, Wow, you experience their kids and, and, and you just immediately make a judgment call on their, on their parents, right? And what, what God is, is saying is, I'm setting them apart and so that when others see you, they'll see me. So that when others see you, you'll be so different that people will ask, what has happened here? Why are they so different? Who is their God? That's, that's what he, he says there in Deuteronomy. Look at even Exodus 34.10. Look what it says. Same thing, Exodus 34.10. It says, Then the Lord said, 
I am making a covenant with you before all your people. I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that the Lord will do for you. They'll, they'll see how awesome God is through, through you. And so there's four reasons. For their own good, to reveal himself to his people, to reveal himself to the nations through his people by setting them apart. And here's the fourth reason, is to reveal humanity's need for a savior. Is to reveal humanity's need for a savior. Romans chapter five, verse 20, 21, look what this says. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through the righteous, through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He gave the law so that he says trespass or sin would increase. Not that, that we would sin more. The point would be that now we would know what sin is. He gave a, he gave a clear expectation of what, what he wanted his people to be because without a clear expectation, we would be wondering and doing our own thing. We, we wouldn't know what it is that God expects and therefore we wouldn't even know what sin is. If God get, didn't tell us what sin is, we wouldn't know. And if we didn't know what sin is, we wouldn't see our desperate need for a savior. If you and I didn't know that we sinned, we wouldn't see our desperate need for a savior. Now this isn't in, on the screen, but I want you to, uh, to hear, there, there's a verse in James James chapter 2, verse 10, which essentially says that if we even break one of the laws, if we break one, then we're guilty of breaking them all. Which means even the smallest one that you think is so small, it's not a big deal. He says that we are guilty of breaking them all. Which means that when you look down on someone because you think that they're worse than you, Listen, you are in just as much need of a Savior as they are. You're in just as much need. Because whatever sin is in their life is, guess what? They're guilty of breaking the whole law just like you are. You're guilty of it all just like they are. The, the worst person you can think of in history, listen to me, they are just as in need of a Savior as you are. We like to put ourselves on a pedestal. We like to put ourselves as separate and say, well, I'm not that bad. Listen, James says, you are guilty of it all. You're in desperate need of a Savior. So we have four reasons that we, that we need a Savior. Do you ever wonder, do you ever wonder whether God's love for for you is contingent upon you keeping all of his rules. You ever go to bed at night and not be able to go to sleep because you're just thinking, man, I had one of those days. And I'm not sure if today was the day where God decided I'm done with this. You ever had one of those? I mean, you had a day where you went back to the thing you said you'd never go back to? And now you're wondering like, does God still love me today? I've done a lot of bad stuff. I don't, I don't know. I know that has been me and my story and is, is the constant wonder, does God actually love me? Does, am I actually even saved? Am I actually part of God's family? I keep screwing up. I hope as we finish with Galatians chapter three, that you have and find some encouragement in this. So let's read together Galatians chapter three. If you got a Bible with you, go ahead and open it up. There, there will also be verses on the screen. But we are gonna read a lot here. So hang in there with me. Galatians chapter three, starting in verse one. 
says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Now, did you hear it in there? That it wasn't by works of the law, that that no no one is made righteous by that? Did you see when he, when he says, what'd you do right before you came to faith? What did you do right before you said yes to Jesus? I, you can raise your hand, tell me if you want, but did you go, you know what? I'm going to go help an old lady across the street so that way I'm on God's good side, and then I'm going to say yes to Jesus. Or maybe did you, did you give a large sum of money and, to some organization and you said, I'm going to get on God's good side. I've I got to do something, and then I know that he'll accept me. My guess, and I could be wrong, but my guess would be that you saw your need for a Savior. That you finally said, I I am far from you, and I want to be in Christ. I'm going to put my faith and my trust in Jesus because I'm not good. And what Paul says is, if you started that way, what makes you think that now, by the works of the law, by following the rules, you'll be made right? If you didn't start that way, you're not going to finish that way. You're not, you're not going to sustain your relationship with him based on all of your good things. It's based on the same way you started, by trusting him, by faith. And he points back to that promise we talked about earlier, right? He points back to that promise with Abraham. Now let's keep going, Galatians 3 verse 10 He says, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Through faith. Are you seeing a pattern? (laughs) Let's keep going. Verse 15. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promise, promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings referring to many, but referring to one, your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For it For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Did you hear it? He said it's by a promise. You you have been set apart. You, You have been given his place. Not because you were good. Not because you followed the law, but because of a promise. A promise that was made to Abraham. And remember how it was made. The covenant was made by God walked through twice. In other words, when I, when, when I will always be faithful, and even when you're not, I'll still be. Because this thing is contingent on me and not on you. It's by a promise. It's by a promise. Let's keep going. Verse 19, why then the law? This is the question. It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. 
and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Do you see it? And th- this whole thing is, I trust you. I trust that you are good. I trust that you're good. And, and when we trust, look at what chapter 4, verse 1 says. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And if you put your faith, your, your trust in Jesus, you are sons and daughters of the king. And it's not because you were good, it's because he is. It's not because you were perfectly obedient, it's because he was. Your faith is based on trusting him, that he has done it all. Relationships come before the rules, didn't it? The relationship with God, it comes before the rules. There are rules. There are things that exist in the faith, but they are not before the relationship. They're because we're in relationship with God. So should we be obedient to Christ? Of of course. But it's not to get anything. Because relationships, relationships that are contingent on, on following rules are not relationships. They're not. Relationships that are contingent on following rules are transactions. And your faith, if it is based on you being perfect and keeping all of God's rules, it is not a relationship. You have a transaction. And that's not what he's invited you into. God is far better than a transaction. So much better. So again, yes, should we be obedient to Christ? Yes. But not to get anything. Uh, Our lives are a response to his grace, not a plea for his mercy. We are responding to what he's already done, not trying to earn it. He's already done it all. We're just trusting that he that he has. I hope today that that begins to answer some of the question around well, what's the role of rules in our faith. But I hope more than anything that you see, we have relationship with God that is based on faith, not on keeping the rules. That our obedience that we're invited into to Christ is just a response to that grace. It's not a plea for something he's going to do in the future. It's thankfulness for what he's already done. And so if you're here and you've 
never put your faith in Jesus, meaning you've never trusted him, I, I want to encourage you, let today be the day that you say yes to Jesus. That you say yes today, I, I'm going to trust you. And here's what we see in Scripture. Every time someone said yes and trusted in Jesus, trust is, is evident by us choosing to be obedient in Christ. And the very first thing we always see in Scripture, in Acts, it's what we see even at the end of Galatians 3, is someone would be obedient, and the first step they would take is they would be baptized. It's this, it's this starting point for us to say, I'm, I'm, I'm identifying with Christ. And in the same way that he died and was buried, and then he was resurrected, I'm also going to be dying with Christ. I, I, I'm identifying with his death, with his burial, and his resurrection. It's the response that we see. It's the first response we see in obedience, in trusting. But I want you to know today that if you're here and you don't know him, he is not waiting on you to clean yourself up. Because again, relationship always comes before the rules. He wants to be in relationship with you right where you are. Even after you did what you did last night. Even after you did what you did last week or what you did right now while you've been sitting in here. He wants to be in relationship with you as much as he does every other person in this room because all of us are in desperate need of a Savior. And so today, I'd invite you into that. We're gonna stand and we're gonna sing in just a moment. And if during that song, you wanna talk more about this Jesus, I wanna invite you to come and have a conversation. Ask questions, you are free to ask questions any of them. If you're a Christian already and, and maybe you needed to be reminded of the truth of the gospel that it is by faith and not by your righteousness, that, that you should stop trying to sustain your relationship in, in your flesh and instead base it in faith the way you started. And if you need prayer in that because you're struggling, there, there are altars that are open up here and people would love to pray with you. Whatever you need, don't walk away today and just keep doing what you were doing. If you need help, you want to ask questions, all of that, we're here for you.